Hey there, this is Cindy, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really glad that you're here. Can't wait for you to hear today's episode. But just before we dive in, I wanted to share some ways that we can work together if you are looking to uplevel your negotiation skills. I've got everything from online to group to my signature one-on-one -on -one mastermind or VIP experiences available. The idea is to try and help you better leverage your innate or natural power to get more of what you want and deserve in life. So if that's something of interest, just check out the website at artoffeminenegotiation.com. And now now the reason you are here onto today's program, really happy to introduce you to Philip Brown today. We'll be talking about how to practice negotiation. So welcome, Philip. It's so great to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. It's brilliant to be here, even virtually, in my view. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are getting past the virtual. Hopefully, we're going to have a lot more live events coming up in the near future. And for those who don't know Philip, following a career spanning more than 25 years, Philip developed and honed his negotiation skills. He worked in procurement for numerous companies across a variety of industries, where he enjoyed negotiating everything from, as he says, steering wheels to global IT solutions to international banking and even cuddly toys. And then in 2018, he started the Negotiation Club, which I can't wait to dig in and hear about. And he started as a platform for people to come together to practice negotiation skills in a safe place. So important because we do not learn how to negotiate and it's such a critical skill. And then he developed negotiation cards that I also can't wait to hear about. And they allow anyone to practice at any time. And now he supports students, professionals and trainers in their pursuit of negotiation excellence through negotiation practice. So Philip, I understand you first entered the world of professional negotiation training at the tender young age of 10. I would love if you could share that with our listeners. I love that story. Yeah. So this is going back a number of years. So basically about in the very early 1980s, my, my father had also been in procurement. So he'd been a purchasing manager and he ended up going into training and started to train procurement people. And one of the courses he would give would be negotiation courses. So in the early 1980s, about 1981, so it's 40, over 40 years ago yeah, now, 1981, he was so busy that he needed somebody to come in and man the video recording <laughs> of people negotiating. So I was literally a 10 year old boy and I was videoing these grown men, predominantly men, yeah. videoing grown men having these negotiations and then when they finish they go off and you know go back into the room and another people you know another couple would come out so i got really interested and hooked in this from a very early age i thought it was fascinating <laughs> and since then really i've always had a bit of an interest in it so that that that's how i got into it really I love that. That's such an early start. And, and I love that you're carrying on the family tradition. I think that's so beautiful. So tell us then what started, what prompted you to start the negotiation club? That's really interesting. Well, I think what happened was, is that there's two things that happened. First of all, obviously in procurement, negotiation skills is pretty important. So I'd been on quite a number of training courses, but I always had this issue that when I'd finished a training course, is what do I do now? You know, who do I practice with? What do I practice? And there never seemed to be anything around. Now, what also coincided was uh, I had the same challenge when it came to presentation skills. So I actually ended up going to a public speaking club, just like Toastmasters, but it was the ASC here in the UK. And I ended up being there for four years. Wow. And I loved the idea of going after work for an hour and a half or so, every two weeks it was, and just practicing with other people you know, safe environment, you can make mistakes, you know, we had people who are really good, people who are just starting for it. And I was thinking, you know, why can we not do this for negotiation skills? And then about four years ago, 2018, I changed my role. So I went out full time employment, I became a contract. But at the same time, I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this, I'm going to see if I can develop this. And that's where the idea of the negotiation club came from. But there was a couple of challenges. I mean, the first challenge is, if you are familiar with going on a negotiation course, you often find you have to do a case study before you can have a practice negotiation. And these case studies will often be pages of information. <laughs> and I thought, well, if you're a public speaking club, you basically get told, right, uh, right, Cindy, we'd like you to talk about yeah. um, whatever, you know, yeah. nightlife, whatever it's going to be. And you can just go and do it. But you couldn't really do the same thing with negotiations. You couldn't say, right, go and have a negotiation. You had to somehow bring that into it. Yeah. So I was toying with the idea, so I can either try and write thousands of case studies or I need to drill it down to the most basic elements. And when it comes down to negotiation, as much as we can put all of the other elements to it, it's basically two parties have a difference of position. So my procurement background, commercial, and I created these negotiation cards. In fact, this is the very first deck I ever made with my own logo and everything else. I love it. I quite literally put 
break-even points, delivery, stock, delivery, charge, and a few of the things on it. So yeah. I created these cards. And it, it was in my head for about another six or seven months. Then I got a group of people to come together and try it out. And I said, don't look at the rest of the variables, just focus on the price. We'll just do a price one. And it worked really, really well. So that was where the cards started from. And then since then, it's been developed. Yeah. I think this is fantastic because, you know, I, as I said at the beginning, I, I don't believe we're taught negotiation as a skill. And I, I happen to think it's one of the most important life skills because all of life is a negotiation, whether you're negotiating with your kids or your intimate partner or business deals with suppliers, you know, I mean, it's all a form of negotiation. So, and we don't practice. And it's one thing to go over it in your head. You know, I'm going to say this and I'm going to do that. and I'm going to whatever, but it's a very different dynamic when you're across the table for somebody and they say something that's unexpected and you hadn't prepared for that. So I love this idea about practice and so why don't you explain to us a little bit about that system, if you can call it that, a practical practice for negotiation. Like what, what is it? Why should people do it, Philip? I'd love to hear more about it. Well, you're absolutely right in the sense that we all negotiate and there's many different forms of negotiation. And, you know, the way that I kind of introduce it is I say, look, you've got the hostage negotiations, the mediations, you've the bedtime negotiations, but we are all familiar with at least the buying and selling type negotiation. Yeah. So what I want to try and do is I don't want to try and get into the complex area of these case studies where it's telling you to be somebody and doing something you're not normally doing. I want to try and use something you already do, because if you're already familiar with it, it gives you a platform to learn from. Yeah. So that's what I do. And I use, I mean, I've got, this is a training set, you know, so there are different, different sets of cards for different levels. And I sell these to training people yeah. right, and companies. But the first one is quite literally, so it's quite literally, you have seller's cards and you have buyer's cards. Yeah. And then all you have on here is you have a sort of a seller's break-even point. Yeah. And you have a buyer's budget. Yeah. <laughs> now, actually, you've now got the potential for a negotiation to find yeah. something that you can agree between. Yeah. So I always use the idea of just apples. We're agreeing the price per ton of apples. Yeah. And then what I do is I say, right, you're the buyer. You need to try and agree a price per ton of apples. You're the seller. You've got to do the same. And it comes together. Four minutes. Yeah. So oh, literally, nice. yeah. show your numbers. Four minutes. <laughs> now, everybody knows what apples are. Everybody knows yeah. how to buy and how to sell. <laughs> And everybody actually knows how to negotiate, but they don't often know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So the way this platform works, the way this format works is we start off really, really simple, all right? And then we layer it up. We start to add more bits to it. So once people get familiar and comfortable with the cards, we then start to introduce tactics. So we then have, well, I'll show you the other cards as well. So we then have these sort of tactic cards where you, excuse me, and just while you're looking for the tactic, I'd like to just wanted to jump in for our listeners there as well to really reinforce what a great idea that concept is about not having these elaborate case studies. Because one of the problems, I think people read these books, you know, whether it never split the difference or getting to get these negotiation books and, and they've got so much going on in their head about, I need to show up this way. I need to cross my arms when they cross their arms, cross their legs when they cross their legs. And they lose the authenticity, which really is at the heart of a negotiation. So I really love, Phil, I just wanted to give you kudos about this idea about just show up as yourself, like just be your authentic self and then layer onto that some skills and tactics. So speaking of tactics, go for it. I'd love to hear what kind of tactics you chat about and how they can handle them. More. Well, I just take it from that authenticity. At the end of the day, we all have our own style. And this is the point is there's no, there's no reasons why we should be saying my style is better than your style. We all yeah. have it. We've got to develop it. And that's what we're doing. So yeah. this is what I'm taking forward. You start off very simply. You understand your own style. You do your negotiations. Then we start to add tactics. And there's hundreds of them out there. Yeah. But we would use basically the same cards. But what I now do is I have, for example, some tactics. You know, satisfaction, mirror words, say no. And there might be other ones. You use odd numbers, threaten, mirror words. And of course, mirror words, you've just mentioned it. I mean, mirror words is made kind of familiar in Chris Voss's book, yeah. you know. But I, I got to admit, mirror words is a tactic you can use in a negotiation. It sounds really useful. It sounds really good in a book. You try and do it. <laughs> Honestly, I have been two years trying to get that tactic home, and I cannot do it properly for the life of me, okay? Yeah. But if you left it to the book, you'd be thinking, oh, that's easy. I'll go it's and do easy. it in my next negotiation. doesn't work. <laughs> you know, and things like, I mean, just things like saying no. 
Yeah. Right? Again, people find it very difficult to say no for different reasons. Yeah. Now, again, the way this program works is you start off, you do your single variables, you get used to that, you start to add tactics to it. And of course, it's not always about price. But once you start getting to the uh, what I call the big boy cards, you start yeah. having lots of details on them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But again, you don't need a big case study. Yeah. And can because, you read some of those out just for the people who are going to be listening rather than seeing, give a few examples on your, on the more advanced card. Of course. So on the, what I turn the multi-variable cards, you'd have, for example, uh, for the seller, you might have a break-even point. So again, you've got to be above that. You might have a, an availability situation. So you can't deliver them within at least three days, or you can yeah. deliver them after 14 days. Yeah. You might have a limitation of stock. So you might have a stock amount that you can sell, but you can't sell more than that. I've got invoice terms on here, you know, payment terms, cash flow is king. I've got an extra one on here, which is delivery charge. And of course, what type are you actually buying? So very, very simple, but they all form the basis of more complex negotiations. Oh. Yeah. And of course, the buyer has their own, but the buyer has some other ones in there, which might include things like quality. So they have a quality question in there and they might have limitations on how much they can have or how little they can have. So again, all of these variables, some of them, there might be some way you can agree. Some of them you might not be able to, but it simplifies it or rather you'd think it's simple. But believe me, it is <laughs> not simple. Yes. However, going back to our public speaking situation, the point is, is that once you've had your four minutes, instead of having to read a new case study, you shuffle the card, you get a new card and guess what? It's a brand new negotiation. Yeah. yeah. So good. And your point is so well taken, Philip, about how, oh, you read this stuff, it seems so simple. And then you're just, you go away with this sort of false confidence that you're just going to apply it next time. And even when we talk about mirroring words, I find it's the mirroring body language that you just, you can tell when somebody has just read a book on it and they're showing up and it is so conspicuous, glaring that it overrides the entire negotiation. It becomes the object of everybody's concentration in the room. So I think this idea about being able to practice in a safe and environment is just so important. So how do you find that with the practice that it allows them, let's say with the tactics, for example, to better handle them in negotiation? Is it just being faced with it and seeing how they react? Or how do you get that layer deeper to start building the skills around some of this? Well, I think there's a starting point, which again, we all have a familiarity with certain tactics that we might use or we might know about. But the first thing you need to do is you need to start naming them. You need to start understanding what you're doing. Yeah. And once you start understanding what you're doing, you can then start to try it out, make it different and grow it. So I always talk about us having our style, like I said. So we have a style. It works well for us in some situations, but not all situations. Yeah. So the idea is that when you practice, you bring in new tactics, you hone those tactics, your style will broaden. And when your style will broaden, it means you can be more successful in more situations. Yeah. Now, when it comes to tactics... You know, they're not always going to be suitable for every individual. And a lot of people will refrain from some of them because it just feels too awkward. Now, my point here is that if you can go and practice the same tactics 10 times, yeah. then even though you might start off awkward, you'll start to understand yeah. it. Yeah. Now, again, you might not use it in a negotiation, but if you see the other party using yeah. it, you can then start to understand how to deal with that. It's that awareness, right? I mean, I, I see the double, the beautiful sort of double-sidedness of this as well. On the one hand, it's increasing your awareness. So you can identify it when other people are using it. You can get intentional about whether you choose to use them or not. And then you layer the practice on where you're just naturally going to be able to grow from the experiences like, oh boy, did I not handle that tactic very well. Now you've got that awareness tying that tactic to that your particular reaction. And next time you tweak and you tweak. So it's a natural evolution and learning process, much more natural way as you say than reading a book or even if you go to a course and then going away and expecting miraculously to be able to apply it i think it's brilliant you had mentioned about how negotiations involve a lot of emotions and uh, emotions often come from certain trigger points yeah so again when you practice you can start to recognize some of those trigger points the one thing i would say is i mean i've been in procurement for over 25 years but it's only in the last two or three years while i've been practicing this that i've suddenly realized so many assets and so many elements of negotiation. I mean, I'll give you an example for that. If I, if we use just the simple single variable cards, now obviously we we know the term a zone of possible agreement. Now the interesting thing is, is if there is a, an area of agreement, when the negotiations happen outside of it, 
we often see a very cooling down in the relationship and the language being used. But when the agreements are all starting inside or around the zone of agreement, it's often very warm. Yeah. Now, I never really noticed this until I've been practicing so many times that now I can see if somebody's quite cold on it, yeah. naturally, it could suggest to me that they generally cannot agree to it. Yeah. So that allows me to reconsider my strategy and think about how I'm then going to make the movements that will allow them to. And as soon as I start to see them warming up, I can think, oh, okay, I can slow down now or I can do something yeah. else. Well, and it allows for deeper insights, right? Deeper insights about yourself, how you show up, what your triggers are, as you say, how you react in certain situations, but also insights that all the, and it is a learned skill to be able to really recognize people's cues, right? When their pace picks up, when their volume changes, changes, those nonverbal cues in their facial expressions or body language. And the, your practice model, I think, is so brilliant on that because it allows you just over and over naturally, some of it through osmosis and some of it as you, you know, as you flub through what or whatever, being able to recognize ah, I'm catching that. It's like playing poker over and over again. You start to see those tells, you start to recognize and be able to connect those dots. And I love, Philip, that you speak to style because it's one thing even having practiced as a lawyer for 30 years, you know, people would come and watch me litigate, for example, or if I'm in a high stakes negotiation and then they'd come in and try and emulate my style. And I'm like, you figure out what your style is. And again, that practice allows you to try on different sort of personalities, if you will, and really get comfortable with what works for you because it's it's like wearing a suit that doesn't fit or something, you know, I mean, it's just, if you're trying to take on somebody else's style and it's not natural to you, it's the other party's going to know it. It's going to, you're not going to be at your best. So I'd love if you could talk a bit to what makes good practice, if there is such a thing. That's a good question as well. <laughs> that could cover so many areas, but if I was to say, if we were talking about what is good practice in a negotiation, there, first of all, practice. You've yeah. got to practice in order to have good practice. <laughs> but there are a couple of good things that I think are really noticeable in particularly good negotiators. First of all, it is their methodology for obtaining information and, and, and assessing and checking their information. So the way that they question, the way that they ask for information. Now, I often say to people, one of the first things that you should be really good at is literally getting information. That's open questions. Yeah. But it is amazing how many people misunderstand what an open question is or how to actually do that. You know, they'll ask an open question, but then they'll add bits of information to give some guidance as to where they want the answer. I saw a beautiful one the other week and the chap literally asked an open question and guided it all the way through to the answer he wanted. And he didn't even realize he'd done it. Yes. And, and the other thing with that as well is if when you do ask questions, don't forget, every time you ask a question, there's a reason for it. So that means you're giving away information about what's important to you as well. Yeah. And it's lawyers really are subtle. terrible about that, at that, Philip, as you can imagine, right? I mean, lawyers are so used to trying to get the answer they want that I think they assume they're very skilled negotiators, but it can actually be a liability for the exactly the reason you said, that even when yeah. you think you're asking open questions, you're directing and pushing the conversation. And part of it, I'd love your insights on this, because for me, I feel like we have been so conditioned historically to see negotiation as sort of a competitive end game process that people have don't show up with the requisite curiosity. We believe that the person who's talking the loudest and longest is the person who is quote unquote winning the negotiation. And, and I used to practice that way at the beginning until I had my epiphany. And I'm like, my gosh, now for me, at least if I find I am totally dominating the conversation in a negotiation, I like stop, drop and roll, just bite the tongue and get into a mode of curiosity, put my ego aside and make it all about them, get and pull as much information as I can about their stated needs, their unstated needs. I'd love your experience about that sort of conditioning about that competitive, make sure you're talking the most model versus really being in listening mode. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I'd probably say it comes back to styles and you know what? There there are people who are very talkative, they've got lots of information. That, in fact, is their style as well. And it's not to say that's the right style or the wrong style, it's just what it is. But I do think that there is a level by which, you, yes, you need to be curious. And I actually say, and I believe this, absolutely, I believe the most important skill of a negotiator is observation. Mm. Absolutely observation. And I'll go back to the practice piece. There is no way 
you can improve your observation without actually practicing it. Yeah. Now, what I've noticed, particularly, again, just using these cards, because up until this point, there wasn't anything like this, but the cards allow you to observe the behaviors. And because instead of the case studies, when you've got a single number like that, when you put a proposal down, if it's not acceptable or if it is acceptable, there are some subtle differences. And you will only notice those when you do the observation piece. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I started to do is I love to use the cards and practice myself because I, I, I'm always learning from doing it. Yeah. But there are occasions when we have a group and I do it on Zoom. Zoom by far is the best way of using these cards, strangely enough. It definitely is. That's interesting. But when I negotiate, so if you and I were having a negotiation, I, I'd show you your cards. Okay, I wouldn't look at your card yeah. and I'll put it down. And then everybody else who's watching, I'd show them my card as well. You wouldn't be looking at that. But I wouldn't look at my card. I would put my card face down as well. Huh? Now, when I have my four-minute negotiation, I'm still negotiating for apples. I'm still asking questions. I'm still there. But my focus now is on where do I believe yeah. the position is with the other party? Is it yeah. acceptable or not? At the end, well, about 10 seconds before the end, I'll turn my card over. And if I can agree to it, I'll agree to it at that point. Yeah. Now, the reason why I do that is that most people go into negotiation, they know their position, they don't know the other party's position, so they gauge their entire result based on their position. Yep. Yep. That is not a negotiation. Yeah. All right, you know your position. I'm almost inclined to say, lock that outside now, because yep. your negotiation is actually the interaction to understand the other party's position. Yeah. That's the big fundamental difference. And I, and I still don't think people recognize or even understand that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, th I, I think that's a game changer because I mean, one of the things I teach is about put your ego aside. And what you described is such a perfect representation of that. You actually put your car down. You are so totally, actually physically not making it about you when you do that. You're not even looking at what your position is. You are entering that negotiation in absolute curiosity mode in terms of finding out what the other party needs and wants. I think that is a brilliant way to approach it. If you imagine bringing that into the real world where you have effectively like a team negotiation, Absolutely. but your negotiators are going in with next to no information about what the business can accept, yeah. but they know what the variables need that need to be negotiated. Their entire focus is going to be on the other party's position. Yeah. And it's not even going to be on the other party's position about, you know, trying to get the number so low down it's upset them and everything else it's about understanding the other person as well and then at the end of the negotiations the other partner can turn over and basically kind of say yeah well we can agree that or that no. yeah but if you've done your job right and if you've done your negotiation skills then theoretically speaking you've done the best possible job you can yeah and that is completely different to going in with my batner with my best position with my walk away you get rid of all of that because that is just all your focus on you yeah. that is no focus on the other party whatsoever yeah. And it gets rid of attachment, which I find, I call it one of the seven deadly sins in negotiation. Like when we're focusing on our end game and goal, we show up with, without, and I think it's subconscious, we show up with a certain attachment to that end result, both in terms of process, in terms of substantive outcomes. And the way that you're describing, it gets rid of all of that. It gets rid of that attachment. It gets rid of the ego. It gets rid of reactivity because you're not in reactive mode. You're not in triggering mode. You're just in absorbing mode. And as you say, observation, so important. And I'd love if you could share with us what are, when you say you're learning and learning and, and really getting more attuned now doing this practice method, but through observation, being able to recognize certain reactions, what would you say are some of the top lessons that you've learned through observing, through observation? There's a few things. I think, you know, obviously when you're in a negotiation, at some point you need to proposal down. Yeah. <laughs> now there's a real challenge that I think we've seen over the last 20 years, maybe 30 years, which is we have moved ourselves away from the negotiation table, moved our way ourselves away from being in front of the other person. We have now put barriers up. We now send emails, yeah. you know, and we put our proposal on an email, then we wait for the proposal from the other party. The art of sitting in front of somebody and literally having that negotiation has really been diluted yeah. to the point where people don't even know they're, they're doing it. So what I'm trying to get people to recognize is that if you really want to maximize the value, really want the other party to be really satisfied with it, you've got to get in front of them and sit in front of them. Now, it's all very good, but it's a, like, a bit like the books. You read the books, you've got to do it. But if you're sat in front of somebody, if you make a proposal 
again, it comes back to this bit of whether it can be accepted or not accepted. Now, what I have noticed specifically is when somebody has a proposal and they can accept it, they will react, I've said it before, they react to certain words, the way they say it, their body language as well. If it is something they can accept, but they're still rejecting it, there are different words, there's different body language, you know, and a different way they express it. But there are lots of other little cues as well. You know, for example, people will buy a bit of time. They won't say no straight away. They won't reject it. They'll come back with a clarification question but they're buying time to then come back and reject it now often that is because they can already accept it but they're thinking and working out how to reject their position most people who will not or cannot accept something will say no straight away yeah those people who are considering it or would like to reject it, even though they can accept it, <laughs> often either delay or they don't say no until yeah. later on. And when you've been practicing, again, when you practice with the cards, after a period of time, because it's what I'm saying is like a book, I'm telling you it, but you have to experience it. Yeah. But once you've experienced it, you just can't help but notice it every time then. Oh, I totally see the value in that. I'm loving this concept. And what do you see in your experience, having seen so many watching people sort of negotiate and practicing over? and over again what do you see some of the key reasons that you would say negotiations fail i would not necessarily say that negotiations are failing at the moment okay i mean negotiations do fail but they fail in the sense that people walk away not realizing they could have achieved more yeah but they're walking away satisfied one of the exercises i do and in fact there's something else i'm going to do in the future one of the exercise well no, no the first session i do everybody's getting the same card. Yeah. So we have different negotiators, different buyers and different sellers, but they all have the same card. Now, what actually happens is they still make an agreement, but they all agree something slightly different, all right? They've got the same information, but they agree different things. Now, I ask them whether they're all satisfied, you've got a good deal. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy, I've got a deal. Yeah, I've got, because they're looking at their card and think I've got a good yeah. deal. <laughs> I then go through and I ask them all what they've got. And some of them will have got a really low price. Some of them will got a really high price. Then you can start to see their faces starting to, to, to twitch a little bit because somebody's done better than them. Yeah? <laughs> so through the comparison game. <laughs> then I open up the card. I put the cards up and I show them the cards. Now, again, this is when the first thing that goes through to me is, oh, you know, they beat me. Yes. Or, you know, or I won. All right. Now, for me, I don't mind. That is what's going to happen. It's a bit of a game at this stage, okay? It's a bit like giving a football to a load of kids. Just yeah. then knock it around, okay? Yeah. We're not trying to get them into the Premier League. league. Yeah. Just go and have a knock around. After they've been doing it for a while, they'll start to also see some of those elements. But the important lesson from that is that you can all have the same information. You can all come out with something different, but you can all be satisfied with that yes. different result. Yes. So such an important lesson and yeah. knowing when to not have to go for the last possible dime on the table. Right. I mean, I remember back days now when I was traveling in Mexico is uh, you, you know, when I was younger and you'd bargain for that blanket on the beach or whatever. And you know, granted I was a student, so I didn't have money. That's how you justify. But it was like, I had to get the cheapest possible human price. And then years later, I'm like, Oh my God. It's like knowing when to walk away. Like, you know what? That extra difference we're bargaining about is infinitely more important to them than it is to me. And I got a deal that I'm happy with. I think that's such an important point that gets overlooked in that competitive. I, set. I think one of the things you're touching on there is values as well. Yes. Now we can assume we have the same value attached with certain elements. And the reality is we all have a different value to different aspects of it. I remember many years ago, I was working for a company and they had, they, they had unions, all right? And there was lots of union negotiations. And I remember talking to one colleague who was in these negotiations and she said, oh, absolutely nightmare. You know, you couldn't get them to agree anything. And then suddenly there was a change. And the guy who was really, you know, on the unions, who was really sort of you know, not moving, suddenly started yeah. agreeing to different things and it was only afterwards that we realized that his personal circumstances had changed yeah he'd got himself know, it sounds sexy he got himself a girlfriend yeah. now he wanted more time and he wanted to do these other things so actually the variables he was negotiating changed yes and yeah. this is the point is that the values that we all associate can be different this is what you were saying about the earth the curiosity bit yeah, yeah. If, if you take before the pandemic before the pandemic cash flow 
payment terms, 30 days, 45, 90 days, pretty much was a variable that would invariably just happen. Pandemic comes along, suddenly cash flow is king. You either don't have it or you've got lots of it. The value of the cash flow as a variable suddenly changed. Recognizing that allows you to then use that to be able to negotiate variables as well. Yeah, so important. And it's funny when you'd said about the key reason, like to the extent we talk about negotiations failing when somebody walks away and there could have been a deal there. I think it really harkens back to what you were saying about that approach to show up just listening, right? Being in that receptive mode, asking those open questions, getting as much information, because that's when you can find sometimes there are creative options to get a deal, as you say, that everybody's happy with that you wouldn't have contemplated had you been just focusing on your end outcome or desire. You miss so many opportunities that are lying on the table between you when you're just coming focused on your own needs rather than that sort of approach of being in receptive mode. I thought that was so beautiful. Now, you mentioned observation is like the key skill or hallmark that makes a great negotiator. What are some of the other skills that you would say make for the best negotiators? observation is absolutely i think the art of communication is imperative as well so as much as you're observing one of the really important elements of a negotiator is when you articulate a position when you're explaining something you make sure the other person can hear it potentially the first time yeah. okay so don't rush it don't make it ambiguous just be absolutely clear and one of the reasons for that is i want the other person to be able to respond and react immediately with the right information immediately so because that observation piece it's very very powerful when the subconscious response all right so we talked about that body language and we talked about the words being used etc well a lot of that happens because we haven't had time to control our responses but if you are ambiguous in what you say the first thing the other person is going to say is, oh, sorry, what did you say? Yeah. And you already start to lose yeah. some of that immediate response. So one of the other skills of a good negotiator is really good articulation and just putting the proposals out there. Now, in terms of some of the things that you should also do in a negotiation and do them very, very well, I've, I've already mentioned open questions. That's a, that's a dead set. That's the first one. But the other one that I often tell people, and again, people might have heard this from me before, is basically summarize. Yeah. You know, summarize all the way through your negotiation, not just at the end. Yes. You know, it does some really important things. First of all, it just makes sure that you're all on the same page to start yeah. with. All yeah. right. So many times negotiation is they, they fall over because somebody is misunderstood or don't recognize yeah. something. You know, they, they yeah. just haven't checked. And then there are some other subtle things with summarizing that, again, people don't understand. I mean, simply saying and labeling it that you're summarizing. So if I said, right, Cindy, let me summarize what I think I've just heard. Yeah. What I'm actually telling you is several things. First thing I'm telling you is I'm not even considering what you said. I'm just checking to see if I know what you've said is correct. Yeah. If I don't say that and I say and I just repeat what you said, it can actually come across as a consideration. I'm actually considering it yeah. and repeating it in my mind. I'm mulling it over. So by saying, let me summarize, what I'm also saying is I'm not necessarily going to consider it. I'm just checking I've got the right information. Now, there's some other subtle things with summary, but that, again, is such a simple thing. And people, people don't, don't do it enough. Yes, exactly. No. And I love it. I, and I think it serves a bunch of functions, actually, Philip, as you're saying that. Because the one, we all want to know that we're seen, that we're heard, that we matter, right? So when you reflect back to somebody what it is they've said, let them know that you're summarizing, reflecting back what you understand their position to be. You're letting them know that you're actually listening, actively listening. And it allows that opportunity for correction because we are terrible at perspective taking as humans. We think we're great. We think we always get it, but we are terrible at perspective taking. And I'd love your quick thoughts on perspective. You know, I love that exercise where if you put a six on the floor and you have one person stand at one side and the other at the bottom of it, one of them sees it as a six, the other is a nine, and they're both correct depending on their perspective, their vantage point. What role do you think perspective plays in a negotiation? Oh, I think it plays as much as it does on when it comes to values. You know, people have different values for elements. People have different perspective on elements. They're almost two of the same thing in, in certain aspects. But, you know, there are so many personal elements of personal traits that come into it. It's very difficult, or in fact, it's dangerous to assume anything in these at all. I, I had an example yesterday, for, for example, I was doing one of the cohorts, university of law, lots of law students. One of the students was exhausted. She'd been working all day. She did the practice and she just couldn't concentrate or anything else like that. And at the end of it, I said, that was fantastic. She said, yeah, but I was so tired. I said, yeah, but what about the lessons you learned from that? Just going into a negotiation when you're tired, grumpy, hungry, 
<laughs> it has an impact on it, you know. And it's the same with different people's perspectives as well. Yeah. Perspectives change depending on how they're going into that negotiation, where they're going to come out from, you know, who they've spoken to before. So, you know, I don't believe there's any single right way of negotiating. Because yeah. if there was, then we'd have one sort of you know, the, <laughs> the law book of negotiation. And one of the things I say to people at the beginning is that there are no rules to negotiation. Yeah. All right. People can do anything. So the only thing you can do is be practiced enough to recognize mm. anything that's happening by the other party, but be comfortable and confident to be able to adapt your own style yeah. to what's happening at the time and moment as well. Yeah, that's a great observation and great advice, frankly, to recognize there's no one way to negotiate. And that's why that practice, practice, practice. Heck, and that's why I often say to people, you know, go to a flea market, go to a yard sale, like get comfortable practicing saying no, get comfortable trying to walk away, you know, get comfortable trying framing the no in more positive ways, whatever. Just get that practice out there to lift that confidence. I think that's so important. So your yeah. cards are brilliant. And I always, I can't believe that you have packed so much information into our time together and it's gone so so quickly, we're going to have to do a follow up because I'd love to keep mining sort of your experience. I love your perspectives on negotiations. I normally like to end by asking what is one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life? And this doesn't have to be about negotiation, Philip, it can be about anything. So one of those aha moments where you're like, think about things differently and it affects how you approach life. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, should have said that to you in advance. No, it, it, it is a bit of a weird thing because as much as we grow old, we're still young at heart. I mean, I still feel like a 16-year-old kid half the time. I think it's something that's happened over the last two years. So before I started delivering these on Zoom, I had this idea of just getting people together just so they could practice together. So physically in a room, use the cards. Actually, it's a lot of fun doing that as well. But it was only when I started to deliver it on Zoom that I suddenly started to recognize elements of the negotiation that you can't do when you're in a busy room and there's lots of noise going on. And I think one of the epiphanies for me more than anything else is the serious stepping back and trying to think what the other person is doing and saying and why they're doing it and why they're saying it. And the only reason that's really happened to me is you can say, oh, look, you know, think about what they're doing. But the reality is, again, it comes back to the cards because the cards are so simple. Yeah. It means you can really start to see the things that happen. I mean, those case studies, the problem with a case study is that if you're using that to learn to negotiate, you're already using up 90% of your gray matter yeah. trying to figure out how to do the negotiation, which doesn't leave a great deal to try and reflect upon it and remember things that happened. Yeah. So for me, I think the epiphany was that, you know what? It's not about the complexity. It's about the simplicity. Yeah. If you can simplify it so that you can just tweak it. I mean, this is it. You and I have a go at four minutes. We try something out. Okay. Next one, shuffle the cards, have another four minutes. I can try something slightly different. Keep yeah. everything else exactly the same. Yeah. Change something yeah. and see how that has an impact. Now, for me, the epiphany has been the simplicity of negotiation practice versus the yeah. complexity of negotiation theory. Yeah. And you know what, that is such a beautiful mindset shift, because not only about negotiations, but as you were saying it, Philip, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what a beautiful mindset shift for life generally. We make things so complicated, our relationships so complicated. And when we can simplify and just get down to the things that really matter to us, our priorities, you know, setting our goals in life. Most of us spend our days running around with a to-do list this long, doing things we don't even enjoy doing, and we have no time left for the stuff that matters. So I think that's a beautiful mindset shift. We, we run around with our card in front of us, very yeah. rarely looking or thinking about the other person's card. Sometimes yeah. you need to put your card down and just spend your time thinking what's on the other person's card. Oh, I'm going to leave it at that. I couldn't, that is such a beautiful finishing point. Philip, thank you so much for being here. I, I love the idea of your cards. I invite everybody to check those out. I think it's such a fabulous resource, but thank you so much for sharing your gems and your wisdom here with us today, Philip. Much appreciated. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And for everybody out there, make sure you can learn more about Philip as well. Check him out on LinkedIn at the Negotiation Club and check out the resources about his negotiation cards and his negotiation club. And I am sure you have all got just loads of value from this episode, lots and lots to think about and go a layer deeper. And at the very heart of it, 
recognize the importance of practicing negotiations. Don't go just reading a book or even taking a program, but make sure you allow yourself that opportunity to practice and learn from it. Don't be afraid to learn from it. And if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, please do. And make sure to share it with anyone that you think could benefit. And in particular, I recommend that you share this episode. Lots of golden nuggets here. Make sure to share that around with anybody that you think could benefit. And Who can't benefit from up-leveling your negotiation skills in life? And make sure to join our Women on Purpose community group on Facebook if you haven't done that yet. And that is a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. Until next time, take care.